I had a question just to kind of get things uh, going here, which is, if you think about, you know, we heard a lot about the future going forward. Is there anything that, uh, that we missed, anything that really has the potential to kind of hugely uh, transform manufacturing over the next, you know, 10 or 20 years that, that someone wants to share? You know? I think that atomically precise manufacturing is going to blow the roof off of manufacturing over the next 10 to 20 years. It will change our relationship to molecules and matter like the computer changed our relationship to bits and information. I have a question about uh, solar power. Uh, Oak Ridge Laboratories is uh, mentioning uh, that uh, space-based solar will be a, a factor in 30 to 40 years, not only to collect in space but transmit to distribution centers uh, on Earth, but also eventually to end use. What is your comment about that? Yeah, I'd say for, for use on Earth, we can power the entire planet with about a third of a percent of the Earth's land area. And while you do get an advantage in space, no atmosphere, and you can uh, not be blocked out by the sun, the liftoff cost is way too high. So for the foreseeable future, it's all ground-based. But maybe if Elon drops launch costs enough, we'll get to the point where space-based makes sense. But I do agree, for use in space, it's solar already. Solar and nuclear are what powers everything that's in space today. Well, uh, I'll just add to that. You'll hear tomorrow from the Made in Space guys who are manufacturing in space. So that might be another way of getting solar cells out there that we haven't heard of. Great. Thank you. Sir in front. Yeah, my question is, uh, See, we have been talking since morning regarding the exponential thing. And we, you know, when it comes to the, any development that we are going to uh, uh, see, we need to also look at the resilient factor part of it. So what is the focus of the, uh, what would be the focus of the resilient factor for the upcoming uh, manufacturing unit? That's one. Um, the second uh, information or maybe the question that I want to share with is, uh, with regard to the energy uh, development, I have a friend who is doing a research on generating energy from the heat that is being generated from the house. You know, we have ACs, we have you know uh, uh, electric bulb being used in the house. So from within your room, uh, we are looking at generating another energy, not a renewable energy, but another energy from the uh, uh, the heat that is being generated by your home. You know, right. so. Thank you. Is there any funding for that kind of things from anywhere? Yeah. I, look, I look forward to it. So on the, on the second one, that's actually an, a great point, and it applies even more to manufacturers. So we have these things called thermoelectric generators. That if you have waste heat in your factory, they're literally solid-state devices that can capture that waste heat and turn it back into electricity. And often the, the price per kilowatt hour you're getting off of them is cheaper than the upfront investment cost, and they are also dropping in cost. So I think that's something that is worth watching for everyone here. Um, you add to the resilience factor, it's uh, really a question for me of agility. How quickly can we switch our factories around to produce the parts that we, we need? GE is a good example. They're, they're experimenting with a concept called uh, the Brilliant Factory that allows them to, in a number of hours, switch between the production of one part and the production of another part, as a result, uh, re reducing their dependency on their supply base to provide the parts uh, reliably. So there's a lot of interesting uh, efforts being done there, and I think a lot of that, as I mentioned in my presentation, is going to be digitally controlled. Um, right? mm -hmm. Software-defined machines also gives you tremendous resilience. Mm. Great. Thank you. Sir? Can you talk about the future location of manufacturing, the possibilities, and particularly from a global perspective? I'm going to speak about that. And then, uh, so I didn't speak about distributed manufacturing, although that's one of my favorite topics. Um, the reality is that we're still in experimentation phase with a lot of these technologies. They're, they're kept in-house. We don't know, yet know how to make them repeatable. So uh, it, it is a longer-term opportunity. But we think by 2027, 10% of everything that's manufactured will be made locally on demand by digital manufacturing equipment, not only additive machines, not in the home, but in other places. That's $1.7 trillion of value shifting from centralized manufacturing to a more distributed scene. But in the counter to that, we're going to see a digital-driven revolution in logistics and transportation, which is going to reduce the cost and convenience of transportation, making it easier to actually bring things from all around the world. Especially in the last mile. 
Yeah. I, I will add one more perspective, which is where are the lowest energy costs? So we see today that uh, data centers get located near cheap energy. So I think there's a lot of ways that a, a location that has an energy surplus can actually export that energy by uh, doing manufacturing on site. So that's the reason that uh, Iceland and Norway are big uh, steel and aluminum producers because the energy is cheap. So I think you'll see that shift to Mexico, the southwest of the US, et cetera. Right. Well, just to add one more thing, the uh, artificial intelligence tools for designing the products, uh, not just making them, is a big piece. We tend to talk about just the manufacturing, but the design is always, is always linked to manufacturing and the ability to design things on demand to meet uh, custom uh, you know, customized needs is also plays into resilience because it uh, allows you to adapt a lot faster. Mm. Great, thank you. I, I have a question. Um, Kak, I wanted to ask you, you bring a very different perspective here as an investor, and I'm curious kind of how you think about balancing uh, some, all these different exponential trends and, and really the tension between kind of near-term and, and longer-term, right? There's a lot of things here that could potentially be very long-term opportunities, but as an investor, how do you decide to kind of make your bets? Yeah, and I think that's been the conundrum of venture, and we were just talking about this in the back, is just lots of these hardware use cases and lots of these manufacturing use cases are super capital intensive, mm -hmm. and they sort of have the sticker shock of a, bill, a million, two million dollar um, prices, and as a result, we're sort of in the business, we invest in these companies that have a bazillion customers, you talk to a bunch of them, you do your diligence, and it's a little bit distributed, moving to the manufacturing case where we might talk to one customer, it's the big pilot use case, and if that's successful, it's gonna become 10, 20 million dollars. But again, it's just a different venture risk. I do think it's changing, um, and I think as lots of you in the room who are driving innovation, small scale innovation, one business unit within an organization, this is gonna start to change. Like as you said, with design and iteration, like, Every small incremental change you can make along the way is going to make it more easy for investors to invest mm -hmm. in uh, smaller scale projects. Great, thank you. Sir. Um, <clears throat> I was wondering what manufacturing challenges have no apparent technology solution yet? Um, I have, uh, I mean, I've been working with McKinsey a bit, and they, they go into different companies and they come up with really interesting use cases for me, and they're like, can you solve this for us? And one of them was automation in al uh, aluminum smelting, right? So we, we don't yet know how to deal with hostile environments, uh, that electromagnetic fields, and we can't bring automation to those areas. So there's a lot of challenges, but for me, um, they're solved by a uh, amalgamation of different technology types in, 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 in one device. I mean, uh, you know, I, I mentioned these problems to my friends in the Valley, and they're like, well, we can just hack together this, this, and this, and we're done. You know, and so I don't actually think they're really, really barriers. It's just that we haven't thought of the right set of, uh, of technologies to apply to that problem, and we're not very good at bubbling those problems to the surface uh, and, and, and bringing them to the attention of the Valley. That's something that we need to get better at. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think in, in many cases, it's just a matter of time. You're going to pick off the bigger use cases where you have more data, you have open source algorithms, because you can apply it to more things. If it's a, it's a more specialized, maybe your case or other cases where maybe it only applies to 10 people or you only use it once a month, those are just going to take longer for people to peel them back because there's probably less money to be had. Um, in the data, I didn't see any charts on the exponential growth okay. in cybersecurity attacks <laughs> and the exponential growth in the digital theft of intellectual property. And could any of you comment on that and how you see this impacting the exponential manufacturing revolutions? I'll recommend a book. Uh, Mark Goodman, one of our uh, faculty, has written a book called Future Crimes that talks about that extensively. So I'd say watch his TED Talk or buy his book, and he has a lot of thoughts on, on those yeah. sectors. Yeah. So I'm also at the Electronic Frontier Foundation where we specialize a lot in those fields. And the truth is that most of the companies out there that are trying to make money by using copyright protection need to find other business models in order to generate revenue from what they have um, because they won't succeed in just trying to get all the computers in the world to be architected to protect their old business models and it's just a harsh reality. So now, in terms of cybersecurity, uh, actually, our current systems are completely insecure, and it's actually a miracle sometimes that the world still works, if you know how vulnerable we actually are. In fact, the only conclusion we've been able to come to is that the bad guys are smart parasites, because smart parasites never kill their host. Right? If they try too hard, um, then you actually come and you try and, and get them, and so they deliberately moderate the amount of cybercrime that goes on so it's just enough that they can get rich and not destroy the world. And so the world probably won't be destroyed, at least until state actors get in the game and we have an actual war. 
Uh, I have a, uh, <laughs> Just I, how do you counter that? Yeah, um, that, well, we've been working with the DoD a little bit, and 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 the reality is, in there's some areas where you're going to want to protect intellectual property. I mean, you know, music maybe not one of them, but uh, but uh, the F18 program might be. And so, uh, and what we actually found is that the new manufacturing technologies, like additive, allow us to have a much better security system than we had before. So, in the case of additive, we've been working for a while with people to protect their intellectual property by streaming designs directly into printers. That's a completely new paradigm. We don't have to protect protect the perimeter anymore. We don't even have to allow the manufacturer to see the designs or the bill of materials. All we do is send that, material, that, that information directly into the machine. So you can think about completely new ways of protecting your information rather than the, the parameter that goes along around it. That's what Authentai started with. The reality is, unfortunately, that people talk about security more than they invest in it. So if you really want security, you've got to find, uh, find the bucks to give to people. Yeah, I would add to that that this is a predator-prey cycle. And viruses and worms and Trojan horses are all little snippets of AI. And we use AI to detect, to do the anomaly detection, to detect them and shut them down. So the good news is that there's far more machines and people on the side of building up the world and protecting the world than those people who want to tear it down. So we have an uneven balance in that predator-prey cycle in favor of The problem is favor of attack us. is usually 100 times understand. easier than defense. <laughs> I understand, but even so, we have a lot more energy and intellect on the, yeah. on the side of protection. Yeah, just wondering if any of you have any thoughts on power harvesting and how that might begin to affect uh, uh, manufacturing and production. Yeah, what do you mean by power harvesting? Uh, being able to grab energy from radio waves or uh, light waves to be able to power devices. Yeah, we do see that. So we do see that some of these small IoT sensors have uh, tiny solar panels or that they have uh, receivers that can get microwave energy. And I think that especially for IoT, especially when the, the scale is tiny, uh, that's increasingly relevant. Uh, I think for sort of large scale uh, devices, it's, it's less so. But if you want to sprinkle sensors, having them be able to get their power from the environment is uh, increasingly important. Uh, I have a question about AI. Um, I'm wondering how far away are we from having uh, an AI guide us in a VR or AR environment? For example, like a shop assistant. Yeah. Um, and how, what's the price of this? Is this also decreasing over time, like an exponential rate? or? Right, so we uh, demonstrated an AI guide for a, a virtual museum 10 years ago for DARPA. So there are various uh, levels of sophistication of these guides, but they've, they're already uh, ones in existence today. So it really is a question of what level of sophistication do you want to see in that guide? And, uh, and the price points are dependent on that. A lot of the biggest dollars in AI research actually goes into generating the non-player characters in games, where it's a very commercial thing to be able to produce synthetic personalities. You mentioned uh, Nike was going to try to print shoes in five years in houses. What about other consumable goods? You know, how would that work? Would they own that printer? How would you print multiple consumer goods in a house? So I, I'm not a big fan of the in-home production methodology in, unless we can print to atomic scale, right? Because we have the material problem. There's 28,000 polymers in the world, so you're not going to keep those stacked next to your honey in different colors, right? Um, <laughs> so just the reality, it's going to be much more like a hub-and-spoke model, right? And, and that's the reality for 2D printing right now. If you want 100 uh, business cards, you get them done around the corner. If you want a million high-quality, very large posters, you get them done in two or three locations around yeah. the world. And with the last mile delivery system that Brad is building over there, we have no problem delivering those either. So it really isn't a question for me about what can be printed in the home. It's about what can be made closer to the point of use. Uh, and that's, I think, the more interesting question. I'd like to, I think, with one exception. Uh, <laughs> with food. <laughs> with food. I think, I think food printing is the one area uh, where you don't want to wait 24 hours. Uh, you want it right there and then, an espresso machine. And I think that's uh, uh, sort of food printing combined with biometrics, uh, nutrition, health, Novelty foods, I think this is really where uh, one area where we'll have production, automated production yeah. at home. <laughs> now it's lunchtime. It's, yeah. it's well known that pizza is the most important thing in America because it has the most extensive delivery infrastructure in the world. So. <laughs> All right. There's a, another question over there. On that, okay, yeah, one last question. Uh, one of the major automotive OEMs a few months ago announced that they were going to stop using robots in their plant, and obviously that decision was made based on today's technology. Um, can you share some advice for manufacturers uh, to, 
you know, to keep trying uh, all of these technologies we're talking about today, robotics, 3D printing, and, and so on. What, what, what advice do you have for manufacturers to keep trying and investing and experimenting? Right, you know, I think man, uh, robotics and manufacturing is, addresses this kind of middle range, where if you, if you have a very small production line, you, can, you use people and humans. If you uh, have a very large production line, you use automated equipment. Robotics fills in this niche in between and sort of, uh, but that, that range in between is growing. It's easier way to program robots, makes them more accessible, the lower end, uh, better uh, uh, value and uh, improved cost, make them uh, more valuable at the high end. So I think uh, we see this narrow band in the middle with robotics, but it's gradually growing and that's, that's where uh, things will be in the future. So it's worth experimenting for sure. I uh, one other thing to add is that I think we've, we've looked at too long robotics as a fixed infrastructure, right? These, they have to be behind gates, they have to be set up properly. The tooling cost is partially, uh, the high tooling cost is partially a response to uh, the, the very fixed nature of robotics to this day. But with uh, human collaborative robots, that's changing. And I think we're going to see a very different robotics landscape out there. Another th to your question on how to continue to experiment is that I, when we work with clients, we say bite off the things that you can bite off in three months. Get the use cases going and flowing in your organization that sensitizes everybody, all of your stakeholders to the technology, and only then think about institutionalizing those, those elements. So it's really about finding the, the quick wins, I think, in all of these technology fields that, that win. Great. I'm going to hold us there. Thank you for your questions, and thank you so much for uh, joining us on stage and your terrific talks uh, earlier today. Thank you. Thank you.